Hi there, I am with KCN Fabish today. KCN has dedicated her career to helping families. She has a master's in counseling and has worked with parents at risk of losing custody of their children. She was the lead clinician of the family support team helping high risk kids in state and foster care. She also provided supervised visitation, home services and parent coaching for DCF. And 10 years ago, she opened her private practice at Compass Counseling and Family Services doing work as a co-parent counselor, which sometimes includes testifying in court for high conflict custody cases. So welcome, Casey. Hi. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. So the work that you're doing is so important and often someone going through a divorce needs a service um, that the lawyer really isn't equipped to provide. And that's where you come in and often attorneys will send their cases to you to assist as a co-parent counselor. Can you explain what a co-parent counselor is and does? Sure. So what co-parenting counseling does is it allows parents the opportunity um, to talk about what's in the best interest of their children um, in a neutral environment. And um, when appropriate, my role can be to provide guidance and input um, from my experience in working with children and families and how children develop um, so that they're looking forward rather than spending time looking backwards on how their marriage failed or their relationship failed and really trying to keep it focused on the parenting piece and not the relationship, the intimate relationship piece. And with your work, do you often find that the anger and resentment and emotions they might have about their spouse carries into their parenting? Yes, so what uh, one of the exercises that I typically do um, with co-parenting clients is um, sort of a reflective exercise that are they reacting or responding um, as a result of their experience because of their relationship versus their experience as parents. Um, and while those will always cross over, I mean, I think it's, um, it's not reasonable to think that relationships will never have conflict, but that a parenting relationship can really come to a place where there is not, you, you don't have to have a lot of conflict. If you try to put the, um, the anger and the resentment and whatever caused the fallout of the marriage or the relationship aside um, and work on that individually, um, then, then we have had parents that can really move forward. And so what if someone is so hung up on how they feel like they've been wronged in their marriage and if it's infidelity or something like that, can they really move past those emotions in order to co-parent effectively? So I, we ha I have had cases over the years where I try very hard to make an effort um, to either redirect if that comes up um, and try to stay focused on the parenting piece, but there are people um, that do require their own intensive individual work um, to address those issues prior um, to really being able to effectively co-parent or participate in co-parent therapy. So we, I have had cases where I've had a couple of sessions and then I, I've said to attorneys or to the parents themselves, you're not candidates right now because you have your own stuff that you have to work out. So you have to come up with um, something that's planful now just to get through the, the exchanges, how you're gonna communicate and things like that, but to actually have a co-parent communication. Um, some, there are some couples that just are not candidates for it in the moment. And what type of work do they have to do in order to become candidates? Because I'm imagining that if those are the, if those people are getting kicked out of co-parent counseling, where do they go from there? So my recommendation has always been that they seek their own individual therapy um, and that they stop um, for a minute and reflect back on that they that divorce and separation are difficult for everyone so as much as they may want to blame the other parent and don't think they need the help you're still going through a divorce that's difficult everyone w would find that difficult so 
Um, I always recommend that they seek their in, an individual therapist. I always assist in helping them find one that I think would be a good fit. Um, because I do think that um, divorce and separation will also trigger, I have found in some couples, that it triggers things that may have happened to them when they were a kid, um, or if their own parents were divorced, that they sort of packed away and put in a box and they thought they were gonna get on and have their happy family. And then when their happy family breaks down, it brings all that stuff back up. Right, it's always our parents' fault, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's right. It's always someone else's fault. In so, the right. <laughs> so, I mean, that, yeah. it, that you just raised a really good point. So that's often such a hard thing to swallow is that someone you may have your a role in the breakdown of your marriage. And so often it's easy to blame the other spouse. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? How do you help someone so, move past that? It's very easy. So it's very easy, like you said, to blame the other person. And what I always go back to is that reflective exercise that I often start co-parenting with, which is, are there areas of conflict between the two of you um, that are based in your spousal relationship as opposed to your parenting relationship? And what I will do is instead of having them talk that out, I actually ask them to draft it um, and write it. And because a lot of times when people write things down, it just starts to come out uh -huh. and then share that with me alone individually that send that to me separately in an email it's not going to be part of the group um and then the other thing that i do is my style i mean i'm empathetic and i you know i try to be um as comforting as possible to people when they're going through this but I, my style is also not to really sugarcoat things uh -huh. so um if after a couple of sessions, I have a, a husband or a wife that continue to say things like, I'm owning my stuff, but mm -hmm. you know, you're not owning yours. That's a very typical comment that gets made. Um, I will get a little tough and I will, you know, there is part of counseling is, is to know when to input com um, confrontation. Um, and so I will, I will sort of confront that, that client on, um, you know, wait, that I, you keep saying that, but your actions are doing something else. Mm, interesting. And then often I will get people that will say, oh, you're right. I didn't, I didn't even realize that wow. that's how I sounded or that's what I said. Um, and then the other thing that I will do is there are, while it's, while it's co-parenting and we're supposed to be meeting with them together, I do assess in some cases that we do need a couple of individual sessions to prepare for the initial co-parenting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a common theme of what you're seeing when, when parents come to you? You know, parents who can agree or if they're mediating, a lot of times they don't mm -hmm. need the services and they can work it out. Right. But you're, you're seeing people who are really having a hard time and they need support in another way. So do you see a common theme of, um, what people are coming to you with in terms of what disagreements they have over parenting? Uh, so the, the common theme that I typically see is often over time, the time that they each get with their child and making it more of a competition versus, um, you know, a agreeable, like, okay, so this week you had little Johnny four days and next week I have him four days. Like, that seems to be a common theme that gets emotions elevated, people in like texting battles with each other. Um, you dropped them off five minutes earlier, you dropped them off, you know, too late. It's really, um, there seems to be a theme of, of parents feeling like they need to compete for their child's attention, mm -hmm. um, rather than recognizing that their child, if they can get along, will love both of them. Right, right. I mean, don't you see that? It's kind of a common thing with you have this term of like a Disneyland parent and the fun parent, right. the one parent buying a lot mm -hmm. of stuff yep. for the kids. Yep, yep. Yeah, and it's that it's that whole thing of like, that's when the other parent uses, they react instead of, re I, I, we, I do this technique, this exercise with are you reacting or responding? And when a parent feels like they're in competition with the other parent, they often react. So you'll get things like, well, this is why they only want to be with you because you buy them everything. Uh -huh. 
or this is why they don't want to be with you because look how you treat me um, versus, okay, so at dads, they get a little spoiled and you can't afford that, but you can appropriately communicate that. Well, listen, I don't have as much money as dad, or I don't have as much money as mom. So you, when you go to dad, you get to play with that big house he put in the backyard. Um, and if kids are, are told honestly, things like that, they are better off than trying to hide it all. And so, all right, this is a great, uh, it's a great thing that you bring up is how much should parents be sharing with kids? Uh, should we be talking to them like adults? Yeah, so you don't want to talk to them like adults, but you don't want to also misinform. So, um, for example, if there is a separation or divorce due to infidelity, the, what you don't want is the kid coming to mom's house or dad's house, and then the other parent says, well, if your mom wasn't with, you know, so-and-so, and making it about that person, um, where they really need to know, no, mom and I are not going to be living together anymore, or dad and I are not going to be living together anymore. And we, but the end result is we love you. You will be safe. Um, but when, when we make it about the other, the other things, that's the information that kids should not know. They don't need to know mom cheated on dad when they're 10 years old. Right. And then that, that person is like, becomes the bad guy. Um, or vice versa. If the so, parents keep it, go ahead. <laughs> do you suggest that um, often as divorce lawyers, we get the question of how do we tell the kids? Do we do it together? Um, what's the best way? Do you have any advice about that? I do. So um, I will often get calls um, just to do a consultation for that. Um, and I'm happy to take those calls because I think it depends on how the parent, if the parents are in a place that they can sit together and, ex and tell their children that they're, they're separating or getting divorced, um, and sort of map out what they're going to say without placing blame on the other. I do not recommend that when it's parents that, um, have impulse control issues when they speak. Um, and that they may not realize, and then suddenly the kids can tell because their face is turning red, or um, mom may say something, or dad may say something, and the other parent shoots over and, and like gives the, the eye daggers. Right. Um, so I, I think if parents can say, listen, we're getting, mom and dad are getting divorced, you know we haven't been getting along lately, um, but we still love you, and, but knowing what the plan is, you are gonna stay here, and live in this house with whatever parent, and this is the parent that's leaving, um, because kids do best when they know what to expect. Mm. So if you're gonna sit down and tell them you're, you're getting divorced, but you have no idea what the next steps are gonna be, I would wait until you at least know what those next steps are gonna be. Okay, all right, so you have a plan, you know what's happening with the house, or you know what the schedule yeah, is. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be the long plan, but at least yeah. you know, like, because the kids are gonna walk away like, well, are we staying in this house? Or am I gonna live with mom? Am I gonna live with dad? Listen, right. you're gonna spend time with mom and dad, dad's staying in the house, and mom's gonna go live with grandma. Mm -hmm. And this is how we're gonna see each other. So if you have at least those basics, and you can have that conversation with your kids briefly without getting upset with each other, perfect. But like I said, we, we, I'm happy. I have had many calls that come in and it's just a phone consultation free of charge. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're going to sit down and talk with, with our kids tonight about getting divorced. Um, here's our current situation. Do you have any suggestions on what we can say? Okay. Interesting. What about the schedule itself? Because I often, this is such a point of contention and someone feels like um, there's too much back and forth. Or, mm -hmm. and sometimes you have a suggestion of a week on, week off, which I personally mm -hmm. hate, but um, any input as to the impact of what it, a, a schedule actually is? So I think that it, um, the schedule d is dependent on the, I, I have found on the child's age, as well as, um, you know, how they are adapting to the transitions. Um, I recently had a case where uh, one of the parents thought it, they have a toddler and they wanted to exchange the child every day. Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely, I don't recommend that. That's so many transitions um, that if you, you could either split the week or um, I think is always a good um, 
opportunity. I think to withhold a parent from a child, I agree with your comment before, for an entire seven days um, physically is, mm -hmm. I, I don't recommend that either. I think the either split weeks or the, um, the schedule, especially as kids get into middle school and high school, they really, I have found, prefer to be sleeping the school week at one place. Um, they really don't like, um, at least we have seen here in my practice, that kids start to get anxiety probably from 11 and up when they got to do this a lot of back and forth. Mm -hmm. Because they, and that's when they're really developing friendships and neighborhoods. And right. um, so it, it really is sort of child specific. And I, I like to say it should be fluid as the child grows. Mm. Um, but if the parents can develop a good co-parenting relationship up front, then that shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't right. be an issue if the parent calls the other parent and says, hey, listen, I got an opportunity to take them to my friend's cabin next weekend. Can we switch weekends? Yep. I have cases now where that's a huge fight. Right. Why? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want your kid to go and have yes. the opportunity to have yes. some fun? Ah, uh, this is such a, a hot topic because we're going into summer. And yes. this is you know, you, this is when the phone calls from old clients start pouring in mm -hmm. because of the disagreement over summer vacation. And yeah. I can't tell you like the number of, of people are, will get hung up on vacation is supposed to be, you know, this day to this day and not take two right. weekends. And, yeah. but if you're renting a house and it's Saturday to Saturday, yeah. like what's the harm? Who, who is it harming? And yet it's this ongoing, um, conflict it's an ongoing yeah it's an ongoing conflict and in the end i will say to people you like this is, your kids are having the opportunity to have fun so is this really again about you mm -hmm. or about your children right and a lot of times it's it's an easy switch yeah. it's an easy switch but there is always one parent i have found in a co-parenting relationship that struggles with giving up um a level of almost like giving in. They look at it right. like giving yeah. in. Mm -hmm. And I still will say, does this go back to your spousal relationship versus you co-parenting? Right, right. And so how do you respond to that? Um, I mean, what if you do have that one parent who just is time and time again really stuck on that and can't let go of it can those two parents um ever have any chance of a successful co-parenting relationship um probably not um and a lot of times they don't um i will say there's no more, i can't help you any more than what i'm doing now i'm suggesting to you yes switch the weekends you don't want to listen to you i don't have the magic wand to say you have to say yes or he has to say no. Right. Um, but I would suggest for your kids' sake, okay, so they get to spend two extra days in Vermont or wherever. What, how, why is that affecting you? It's because he's getting more time. Right. You're not looking at it like your kids are having fun for two more days. Right. Um, and those are the parents, I actually have a set na now that I work with and I, and I have said to that mom many times, I'm not sure what else I can do to help. Right. And courts can't fix this either because it's no. often then we'll go back to court. Well, what do you want a judge to do with this? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's about just being reasonable and flexible and open. Mm -hmm. And, and at yeah. that, at the, that's the framework for successful co-parenting, I think. Yeah, I, I have a, a family that I work with and they don't come for co-parenting. Um, I, I see their children. But they co-parent so well. I have said to them so many times, you guys should write a book mm -hmm. or you should be, you should hold like groups or forums. Um, I mean, it's to the point they both have new spouses. There are mixed families with mixed kids, mm -hmm. but they, the, the, the primary parents still are in charge of their children. They share a calendar on their phones where they put their kids appointments in. They all know who's doing what, when. Um, and the other, you know, that it's also a, a, the new spouses that come in and mixed families that come in. If there's no jealousy happening, that these are the two parents that are in charge of their kids. They have a shared calendar on their phones and they work it out. Right. I mean, that's my ex and I too, because we have yeah. actually, uh, hopefully he'll come on as a guest for this. Yeah. He's a little yeah. skeptical, <laughs> probably for a good reason. But yeah, I mean, it's, 
um, my, so my son's 14 now. He was two when I got divorced and he is, you know, so well adjusted and we're yeah. able to switch things up and, and trade mm -hmm. off and figure it out. And he's a teenager and, you know, yeah. when you get the older you get, the more flexibility is just required because of his own schedule. You know? Right. He's, he's got a social life now. He right. doesn't. And that's what I find is I'll get co-parents that get mad at each other. And it's really, you have a 14 year old boy who wants to hang out with his friends on Saturday. He doesn't want to go to dad's or mom's or right. whatever. And, but if you, what I try to recommend to parents is if you let them do that and then you call them on Tuesday and say, Hey, let's go grab a hot dog. Let's right. go to the new movie coming out or whatever. They're more, they're going to say yes. Right. Right. And I think people forget that they can be a support to you. So there have been so many times that like I've needed to call up my son's dad and say, Hey, I have to work late or can mm -hmm. we switch a day because I have something going on or I'm being held over and I'm not going to be able to get to the school at, t at time. Can you call your mom or your dad to help? And I mean, it's a support system. So it's yeah. not someone to work against. It's someone to work with. Because I, I think, yeah, you just made a very good point. Cause I find that it's, working against each other when yeah. when they get to my office they're working against each other yeah oh that's i so don't sad. get the referrals of the people that that are getting along well yeah right yeah because they don't need you yeah <laughs> what about blended families because that does bring in a whole nother set of challenges and dynamics and any advice as to for step parents um in setting boundaries and rules for them yeah, so I recommend and I have found it to be helpful is that if there are blended families involved, um, that they actually get involved in the, in the counseling and therapy process, that if they're, whether it's co-parenting, because I, you know, I will get referrals for co-parenting, but then I may assess after a couple of sessions, like, hey, I think we should bring in mm. the, at the other spouse or um, the, even the kid and have a family therapy session. It doesn't mean we're shutting the door on co-parenting, but what I try to do is look at the whole picture and then decide, okay, there might be other players here that would be helpful to have sessions with. Um, and I think if they can all get involved and then everybody's on the same page, um, it really does make for a much more cohesive um, communication style for everyone. Do you have any hard and fast rules of what absolutely should not be happening with step parents and, and boundaries and things like that? Yeah, so one of the, the hard and fast rule I think in general, but especially with step parents is making any negative comments about the other parent. So, well, if your dad knew how to do this or if your mom knew how to do this or, um, or you know, well, if your dad would have just switched weekends with us, we would have been able to go, uh, you know, to Las Vegas or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. making anything negative is, but again, that's also a, a hard and fast rule. I say to the parents who may not have new spouses yet, you don't say negative right. things about the other. Um, and then the other thing is if it's a new blended family and they don't have things established is that one of the conversations that really needs to happen with all parties is what discipline looks like. Yeah. Because when kids think that their parents may not communicate or may not get along, they have a higher, they're at a higher risk of manipulation. Oh, yeah. So, um, and I, we see that. So um, it would be one kid coming home dad and saying, oh, you know, mom's new boyfriend, you know, slapped me or, mm. and it may not have been that or, so I think that when new spouses get involved, one of the, the biggest conversations that needs to happen is what does discipline look like? Because if that conversation doesn't happen and then the new spouse disciplines the child, I've even had it where um, it was not discussed. So say I had a new spouse and he disciplined my son and then I didn't expect him to. And now I'm yelling at him like you don't have the right to do that right? because we never discussed it. Yeah. Oh, that's, I mean, you're getting ahead of a potential problem. Right. Because it becomes, that becomes one of the, the largest issues 
um, that I have seen, even in just seeing some individual kids we see who are parts of blended families, um, is how the step parent interacts with them. Oh, so interesting. Yeah, definitely some challenges there, for sure. What are the consequences if parents really can't um, can't keep their their put aside their emotions and it impacts the kids in some way? What type of long lasting effects can it have on them? So kids whose parents um, who have chronic you know parental conflict, especially high high conflict. Um, they're, they're often linked to having increased aggression, not really being able to attain academic performance because they're in school and they're thinking about the fight they heard last night or whether or not dad's going to get mad because he wants to go to mom's today. Um, so academic attainment, aggression, um, and then it will impact their ability on future relationships and what that looks like for them. Um, because they will have poor interpersonal skills because as we know kids kids watch what we're doing right. and i mean that happens to me every day now that i'm home with my son all, all the time he'll say things and i'm like oh my god he sounds just like me <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> so you know so i think that that's really important they're always watching us no matter their age so if we're not able to demonstrate positive interpersonal skills and being able to problem solve then they're going to lack the ability to problem solve, um, especially if they are part of frequent fighting and parental conflict. Right, right. So what about the, the idea that divorce is in, in and of itself is damaging to kids? Because sometimes you'll hear parents say, well, they stayed together for the sake of the kids, even though it was a horrible relationship and mm -hmm. they were fighting and all of that in the house, but for the sake of the kids, because the divorce in and of itself would have been more harmful. Um, I don't actually agree with that statement. Right. Um, yeah. There, no, I, so, I didn't say it for you to agree. Yeah, to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, there are actually positive outcomes for divorce. Oh, so tell me. Yeah. <laughs> so kids, um, kids who are um, staying in a home where their parents are either not communicating or fighting all of the time or um, self-medicating with substance abuse, alcoholism, because it's easier to come home and get drunk rather than deal with the family. Yeah. Um, those all have the same negative impacts as that divorce. So for those kids, the positive would be resilience, that um, while mom and dad problem solve this, they realize they don't belong together. Wow. And they're separating. I have had, I can, I have had several memorable sessions with children who have been thrilled that their parents have been, have decided to get divorced. Because they would rather, they have great relationship with mom, great relationship with dad, but they hate being home with them together. Oh, interesting. Are they typically older kids or younger? Um, I've had kids, I haven't had really young kids tell me that, but I've had kids probably eight and up to teenagers. I've had a, t we, I've had a teenager over the course of my practice in, you know, the last... 10 years that would that said to me i've been waiting for this for so long wow so it's not the divorce we are debunking that fallacy mm -hmm. that divorce in and of itself damages kids it's the conflict right it's the conflict yeah yeah because even the divorce so the divorce itself if it goes smoothly and there's no conflict, those kids are actually gonna be better off than the kids that stay in a marriage or stay with parents who are staying in a marriage that are, that are fighting every day. Yeah, right. Because now you're looking at just an adjustment period and then they can get resilient and move on. So when does somebody like you step into the process? When you're at the beginning of the divorce, when they're through the divorce, where can you help them? So where, where we get the referrals now here at my practice is typically when 
the parents have already filed for divorce um, and they are unable to communicate and work out some of the things that have nothing to do with the legal piece like property and finances and things like that. So we will get, re I will get referrals um, either from the parents or from attorneys or GALs. Um, and then the other place that I'm getting the referrals is now is after parents have been divorced for many years and their kids are growing up and they need to rethink their parenting plan ah. and, or, or something happens and they end up back in family relations at court and then family relations is sending them like, you guys need to go work this out. This isn't something that a judge needs to be figuring out for you. However, what I think would be helpful is if co-parenting counseling, even if it's just a couple of sessions, became part of the initial stages of divorce. Yeah, right. Prior to um, the conflict really becoming very difficult, if they're able to work things out in the beginning and have those hard conversations, then they have some control over what life will be like moving forward versus having someone else decide. Right, right. It should, it should be part of the process. So in Connecticut, the state that both Casey and I are in, there's parenting education class, but that is a group class. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're talking about is just this individual sessions to really mm -hmm. help the parents figure out co-parenting so they don't end up back in court and right. back in the conflict. Yeah. So really, they can be using someone like you bef uh, rather than even going to court. So if it's post-divorce and something comes up and there's a disagreement, before they run to lawyers or file any motions, they should be picking up the phone and calling someone like you to help them work those things out without having to get the lawyers involved and the judges involved. And Because most of those issues are not legal issues. Right. And um, what I have found is that seems to be a trend that prior to this COVID-19 stuff happening, that has seems to be a trend, at least in the New Haven County Superior Court family stuff, um, is I have found in some agreements that end up getting entered into court is that the first step, if another issue occurs, is not to go back to court, that they have, uh, there's actually like a, a statement in the um, agreement that says, that they return to me first before. Right, right. And then if I can't be helpful or if I recommend that they go back to court, right. um, but that the first level becomes, comes back here versus um, people filing motions back and forth. Right. So what are your top tips to co-parent effectively? Okay. So my top tips to co-parent effectively, I actually wrote them down. So I'm going to just refer to them so I don't forget. Um, is that you have to make the choice to be a, a good co-parent, um, that it's not easy and that you have to make the choice and respond versus react, um, that you have to respect yourself and respect your ex as a parent. You may not respect them as a person. I mean, I've had people that say to me, I think, you know, he's, they're a horrible human being. Okay, but they're still your child's parent. Right. Um, so you have to respect your, your ex as a parent, and then respect your children because they deserve to have both of their parents involved. Um, keeping a regular schedule for the most part works, but being flexible. Um, and then talking, there's this whole thing about our family wizard, texting, email, because everything needs to be documented. But I think that at some point, at least in my practice, I like to try to get parents to the place where they can pick up the phone and talk to each other yeah. because with texting and email, the burden is on the reader. Mm -hmm. So I may send you something and depending on your mood of the day, you may take it a different way than I meant. Right. Um, be a team, uh, pick your battles, not everything. Okay. So two socks came back versus four. Okay. Get another pair of socks. I don't, you know, like pick your battles. Um, be respectful of each other's values. I think that it's okay. There's this whole methodology of the, that both houses have to mimic the same. They, they should be the same. Yes, that would be ideal, but it's okay for kids as long as they know what to expect. Okay, these are the rules at dads. These are the rules at moms. Right. Um, give your ex the benefit of the doubt. This is where the kids, um, especially older kids, are very good at manipulating if they know their parents aren't speaking to each other. 
Um, so they may come and say something that may not be true. So give your ex the benefit of the doubt and have a conversation if there's something you're concerned about and um, don't give up. All right, that is great advice. And my final question is, how can someone reach out to you and find you and pull you into their team to help them co-parent? Okay, so um, you can call our office um, at 203-691-5804. Um, you can find us on Facebook. I'm always posting like little comments or, or um, recommendations for things um, at Compass Counseling and Family Services. Um, LLC, or we're also on psychologytoday.com slash Casey Ann Fadish. Perfect. Thank you so much, Casey Ann. This was Thank a you. great information. Thank you. Thanks so much.